Time having arrived, I call the meeting of the uh, school committee for December 3rd, 2019 to order. Please stand and salute our beautiful flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, good evening and welcome to the uh, school committee meeting. I, I know we got a packed house. I'm, I'm not sure that they're here for you, Mike, or, or if they're here for me. But uh, people are happy that it's going to be the, my second to last meeting so that they're really <laughs> thrilled to see me uh, gone. No, I'm just kidding. Um, do we have, we don't have any visitors, right? Having none, I'd like to move um, into the uh, consent agenda. These are items that are routinely taken together, uh, and any member can take any items out of, out of order. Um, I move, uh, Mr. Mayor, to take item B, approval of November 12th, 2019, Superintendent's Contract Subcommittee meeting out of order, please. Second. A motion has been properly made and second to take B out of order. All those in favor? All those opposed? B shall be taken out of order. Anything else? I would like to entertain a motion to accept the consent agenda minus B. Motion to accept the consent agenda minus B. Second. Motion has been properly made and second. All those in favor? All those opposed? It moves. Okay. Item B, sir. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, this is a very special evening for the uh, school committee, for the um, Brockton Public Schools, for the city of Brockton, um, for the students of Brockton, and certainly for um, um, the family and friends of interim superintendent Michael Thomas. Um, the school committee, uh, after the election, met and had um, uh, a couple of superintendent contract subcommittee meetings. Uh, it was uh, unanimous and overwhelming that um, the school committee felt that uh, Michael Thomas <coughs> would lead the Brockton Public Schools in the direction and the city in the direction that um, uh, we, we, we know uh, the potential to, to be our best uh, will be met. And uh, Michael is a, um, is a Brockton son. He's a long-term Brockton, uh, Brockton boy who's made good and... Um, I think Michael crosses over all of the um, constituencies and groups and teachers and students and politicians and community members. Uh, he just is an all-around uh, Brocktonian who welcomes everyone. Does not matter if you're a woman, if you're a man, if you're white, if you're black, if you're brown, whatever. Michael accepts everyone for who they are and what they are, not. Uh, not because of any certain race, religion, or what have you. Um, so, that being said, we, um, uh, on uh, November 19th, we went into a session to hopefully negotiate, I'm sorry, November 12th, to negotiate a superintendent contract, which we were successful. Um, so, Mr. Mayor, I would like to make a motion uh, to ratify the employment agreement between the Brockton Public Schools and uh, Michael Thomas uh, as the superintendent of the Brockton Public Schools moving forward. Second. A motion has been properly made and second. All of those in favor? Can we on the motion? On the motion. On the motion. Um, I've had the pleasure of my years of working with five superintendents and one interim superintendent. And uh, I've met Michael way back when, uh, when I served on the Brockton Community again? Schools, and of all of the superintendents that I worked with, none, none of these superintendents had the qualifications that Michael had. And that, for me, was really important. And I remember when I first met Michael, I said to Kathy Smith at the time, who was uh, head of the community schools, I said, this guy is going to go places because he's really an amazing individual. And just to give you a, a, a brief overview, uh, he was a phys ed teacher, administrative internship, department head, um, yellow house, house master, Azure house master, executive director of operations. Dad 
that it was high time that we took the interim out of there so Michael can start the ball rolling, do his executive plan, do his three-year plan, his five-year plan, whatever, uh, to keep the, the school district running the way he has. And he has not disappointed anybody that I can see. And when I was down in Hyannis for the um, school committee conference, I mentioned Michael's name came up several times in conversation. And superintendents from across the state hold this man in high regard. So we did something really extremely well by putting Michael in charge of our school district, the fourth largest school district in Massachusetts. And he's going to do nothing but great things. And so, as I said, I've worked with five superintendents, some good, some not so good. He's the frosting on the cake that we've been looking for to lead our school district. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Bassett. One question for him. Um, this is a great night for all of us, uh, but personally, it's really a great night. It's cool. Because <laughs> uh, I've known Mike since I was probably 14 or 15 years old. <clears throat> Both, you know, big white basketball players from Brockton. There aren't a ton of us out there. Um, but Mike was always a guy that we all looked up to. Um, you know, he was a guy that was, when I was a kid, was always around. He was at the Boys and Girls Club um, before he got in the school system. Um, and he's always somebody that I've looked up to um, professionally and personally. He's just a great guy. And uh, he's always been accessible from the time that, um, you know, he was at the high school as a, as a housemaster or dean now um, till. I remember sitting in the gym at my current school, probably getting trouble for this, emailing him, uh, I want to come back next year <laughs> before I ran for school committee. And he got right back to me. And, um, you know, he, he's just a person that everybody can talk to. Um, and when you walk into his office as a, as a parent, uh, you'll get heard. And, um, you know, you'll feel like your, your problems will be addressed. Um, but, you know, personally, this is a, a really amazing night as I close out my time here uh, to appoint my friend. Mike, <laughs> as the superintendent of Brockton Public Schools. Uh, congratulations, Mike. Um, so I'd like to say this is a great night for Brockton Public Schools having um, uh, uh, Mike as our, our new um, superintendent. And um, you've actually been pretty much auditioning for this job for nearly six months now. And what I wanted to share about that is, I mean, I've worked with you, you know, we've all worked with you for several years, so, um, but because you've been the interim, you really had an opportunity to show what you would do and for us to see the kind of superintendent you would be. And, um, you know, as much as I already was behind you for superintendent at that point, um, now over these last several months, you've absolutely made it clear that, that you are the right person for the job without question. Um, there was one point where it was, you and I had a meeting several months ago, and I brought you a list of concerns that some parents had approached me with, you know, and what was impressive about that meeting is, first of all, everything on there you knew about and you were working on and already had a plan for, an idea of what you wanted to do about it. We had a great conversation about it. There wasn't anything that you said, oh, I wasn't aware that was an issue, you know? And you were already working on those things, and we talked about some of the things that you had done and were planning on doing to address those concerns. You were already on top of all of it, um, which, uh, like I said, that's why I feel like this has been almost a six-month audition, and then I come to you with a, a list of concerns from constituents. You were on it, you know? Um, so that, you, you've auditioned well, my friend, um, you are very much the, the right person for the job um, to lead this district forward, and it'll be, it'll be a privilege working with you, and I'm, I'm really proud to um, vote for you tonight for this. Okay. Um, I've known the family for a long time. Mike is always available. He's always there to solve a problem. He's a good communicator, and he's from Ward 5, so I say we make him superintendent because Ward 5 is the best. Thank you, Mr. Pope. I just wanted to thank 
I really didn't have a speech ready, but I wanted to say that Mike is a person that you can call and he answers the phone. It was even today I had a call, which is unusual. And uh, I wanted to mention as well that it was unanimous on that vote, including the mayor, which normally doesn't vote, which is almost unheard of. I don't think anybody's been unanimously voted as a superintendent in the time I've been here. And congratulations, Mike, you deserve it. And I know you do a good job. Thank you. You know, as politicians, they hand you a microphone, you gotta say something, right? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but I, I come at this from a different perspective uh, because I, uh, I come from the city side of things as well. Uh, and I'm a strong believer that you know, as our school goes, so does our city. And the fact that we, we are entrusting you with the duties of uh, uh, representing and guide this great school system that we all call home, I think it's a great honor for all of us, but I'm sure it's something that you will, will take to heart and uh, realize that you know, you're someone special and someone that uh, a lot of us are are happy to have you. I mean, uh, you hear how other systems are looking at possibly doing some things that they shouldn't even be looking at uh, because you're ours and you're going to be with us uh, for quite some time because I think uh, you bring your heart and soul into this and I'm honored for the fact that I'm sitting here uh, as part of this whole uh, committee to uh, unanimously vote you in as uh, you know, and it gives me a great deal of honor to basically ditch that ti the uh, interim title and start calling you superintendent of schools from, uh, from this point forward. So I think everybody has said something. But anybody else wants to chime in? Thank you. Thank you. So a motion has been properly made and properly second that we rat ratify the, uh, the superintendent's contract that we discussed back in uh, November. All those in favor of its ratification? All those opposed? It's been ratified. Thank you very much. Congratulations. <laughs> Don't speech. I'm going to do this without crying. I promise, Brett. I'm not going to cry, Brett. I'm not going to cry, Roy. Remember? From <laughs> so um, I just want to say thank you, obviously, to the school committee uh, for your support of me for a very long time since I started working at Central ten years ago. I want to thank uh, Mayor Rodriguez, uh, Mayor-elect Bob Sullivan, uh, who I went to school with. I want to thank the late Mayor Bill Carpenter, who I worked with for a long time uh, when he was on the school committee and when he was, with May when, when he was the, uh, the mayor. Um, so I want to thank you all very much. I really appreciate your support and your, your kind words really mean a lot, mean a lot to me because we work so closely together. So I really appreciate that. I want to recognize my wife, Trish. Um, my girls are here, Sarah, Alyssa, and Caitlin. So the only other male in my house is, is a dog, so he and I are the only ones, so. <laughs> I want to recognize my mother and father, George and Sheila. Um, both, both Brockton High grads, um, along with my in-laws, George and Pat Pika, both, both Brockton High graduates. Um, my sisters, Debbie and Sherry, are here, also Brockton High grads. Uh, my Aunt Lynn and my Uncle Jimmy, I appreciate you being here so much. I, I appreciate that. Um, I grew up in a very modest house on the east side, um, and that's um, why I, I am who I am. My father welcomed everybody into our house, no matter what race you were, religious background, no matter how much money you had, he welcomed you into our home. My mother and father, she always was ready to make somebody something to eat. Um, and it was a, doesn't matter what hour of the night or the morning, 
the house on the east side was uh, the front door was always open. The paper boy would come in and eat with us, and um, it just that was the kind. And I grew up in a very diverse neighborhood. That's what made me what I am. Um, I'm happy to see Ollie here tonight. I had Ollie when he was 13 years old. He <laughs> He worked with me as we worked together on a farm in Bridgewater. And uh, he and I had a lot of fun, but seeing him here tonight. <laughs> but seeing Ollie here tonight means a lot because I uh, obviously, you know, I made an impact on him and that was my goal when he was 13 years old and the, and the man he's grown into and the, and the community activist he is, it just really makes me feel good to see him here tonight. Um, I want to thank Kathy Smith for the six years I worked with her. As her deputy superintendent, she taught me a lot. I worked, started working across the hall from Kathy Smith um, 26 and a half years ago. Um, and I spent a lot of time working with Kathy. I want to thank John Jerome, who I work with closely as the, the deputy superintendent. Um, I want to work, thank my first mentor who's here, my first principal I worked for, Donnie Burrow, who in, in his assistant and I, both of my friends, uh, Mr. John McDonough, I worked, they used to let me hang around the office when I was a phys ed teacher at East. Um, and that's where I got into being interested in, in administration. When I was going through my masters at Bridgewater State in ed, ed leadership, uh, Donnie and John you know, treated me like I was one of the administrators there and that's how I was able to grow into being an administrator. So I wanna thank both of them. I wanna thank my executive team members who are here for their support and the hard work they put in every day. I wanna thank all the former people I worked with at Brockton High, I see a lot of the administrators here tonight. I worked with them for 10 years uh, at the high school. We did some really hard, good work at the high school and I wanna, I wanna thank them. Um, and all the staff that I worked with uh, over the years, the administrators, the teachers, the custodians, the paras, the MTAs, um, my community mentors who are here tonight, some of us with us, um, you know, the food service workers. I work with, try to work with everybody. Um, I don't look as my, at myself as a superintendent. I look at myself as one, a member of the Brockton Public Schools. And I, I've done every job. Um, I'll continue to do that and I treat everybody the same. And that's been my message throughout the district since day one. We treat everybody the same no matter what. And, um, and that's what I thrive to do every day. I wanna thank um, the city partners I worked with closely over the last um, 10 years. Um, the Broughton School Police, the Broughton Police, several of them here tonight. Um, I thank you for being here, uh, Lieutenant Mills, Lieutenant Vidaro, uh, Danny Vaughn, Officer Smith. Um, I've worked closely with them for a long time. And the support of uh, the Broughton Fire Department, the DPW, the city, the city Building and Health Department, I worked so closely with them over the last several years and they've all been very supportive of me. And um, you know, it's just, it's happy to see you all here tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, in the, in the work is people don't see Ken Thompson, who I probably talk to 10 times a day, <laughs> who takes care of all kinds of things for me. And it's great to see Ken here tonight. And um, in the form of people I used to work with all the time, I, I really appreciate it. I know I'm going on for a long time, but I wanted to make sure. It's like the Academy Awards. I don't want to miss anybody. <laughs> but I, I really appreciate everyone being here tonight. Um, it, it's, it's humbling to be named superintendent. Again, I was you know, just a kid who grew up on the east side of the city. And, um, and just, um, this is an amazing honor and I really appreciate it. So thank you all very much. I really appreciate you all being here. And I, I, and I, I, I also don't wanna forget um, my friend who's the union president, Kim Gibson and I, who spend a lot of time. Um, Kim has been an amazing support. Um, she and I will battle at times, obviously, cause that's her job and I have my job, but we have a very good relationship and, um, you know, she obviously is another born and bred Brockton High graduate who cares, you know, deeply about the city and the kids. And, um, and she leads her union uh, with honor and dignity and, um, and she, you know, and she pushes back when she has to. So I appreciate her being here. So again, thank you all for being here. Everybody, I, I, I wish I could go through and mention everybody's name, but um, I really appreciate everybody being here tonight. And um, again, I'm honored and Again, Mayor, thank you very much. And School Committee, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I think we're going to take a two minute recess. Uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, I do have some, a statement that um, Superintendent Kathleen Smith 
would like me to read it? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, this is a letter from um, Superintendent Smith. Dear Mayor Rodriguez, the Brockton School Committee, it is with elation that I write this note congratulating all of you on selecting our new superintendent of the Brockton Public Schools, Michael Thomas. I've been fortunate to have served alongside Mike in a variety of professional roles <clears throat> during our careers together in our beloved school district. I've watched Superintendent Thomas as a young teacher at East Junior High connecting with all students, especially those students in need of care, a, a caring adult. He has worked tire, tirelessly in many roles throughout his career in the Brockton Public Schools, first as a teacher, coach, department head, assistant dean, dean, executive director, and even as the interim principal at Brockton High School, his alma mater. I was fortunate to have Mike serve as my deputy superintendent during my tenure as superintendent. As Mayor Carpenter said to me many times, Mike is the most loyal assistant to you in everything you are trying to accomplish. In fact, that is what made us successful during very trying times these last seven years. I'm so appreciative of having his knowledge, wisdom, guidance, and guidance as we led the best school system in the Commonwealth. Michael Thomas was destined for the job of superintendent of the Brockton Public Schools. I am confident that he will serve with integrity and distinction for many years to come. He will provide stability, collaboration, and accessibility to those who he will lead as our school community supports our students throughout the district. Please offer my congratulations tonight to Mike, Trish, and their three beautiful daughters, and also to his parents, George and Sheila Thomas, for raising a son that will make his mark on the city of Brockton as the East Side boy and Brockton High graduate and the leader of the fourth largest school district in the Commonwealth. Congratulations to all, Kathy Smith. Two minute recess so we can uh, sign the, uh, the official contract and then also allow some people that probably would like to leave and not go through the whole meeting here. So we'll take a two minute recess. Well, we're going to call the meeting uh, back to order. That was a, a great event. I'm glad I was part of this uh, historical night as far as I'm concerned. Uh, we should all be proud of, of the fact that we did the right thing to make sure that our school continues to be led by someone who truly believes in this, in this community. At this time, I'm going to turn the meeting over to the superintendent of schools for his report. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Um, first, we're going to start with our student report for Georgina Eunice, and she's going to Give us an update on Brockton High. We thank you for being here, especially on a snow day. Thank you. Um, good evening, Mayor, Superintendent, and School Committee members. Thank you for having me here tonight. As you all know, it is a busy time of year at Brockton High School. At the start of November, 15 members of the Model Brockton City Council worked in collaboration with Brockton's Election Commission and worked the polling locations during our citywide elections. The members who participated found the experience very educational and interesting, and I would like to say congratulations to our newly elected officials. A ceremony was held on November 19th for this year's 64 National Honor Society inductees. Congratulations to those inductees and their inspirational teachers. Entrance to the society for juniors and seniors is a rigorous process which includes multiple essays, exceptional grades, and many volunteer hours. During Thanksgiving break, the Brockton boxers and halftime performers ended their season playing Bridgewater Raynham. Also, the JRTC and Brockton High School marching band, color guard, majorettes, and dancers participated in the city's 33rd annual downtown holiday parade. Despite it being a little chilly, everyone had a wonderful time. This evening, the Classical and Foreign Language Honor Society held their fundraiser at Texas Roadhouse. Many students within the society volunteered their time. I'd like to thank Texas Roadhouse and those who made the event possible. The Class of 2021 will begin selling tickets for the, a holiday raffle tomorrow, December 4th. The sales of the raffle will continue up until Christmas break. The proceeds support the junior class and assist in making the cost of prom more affordable for all students. On December 6th through the 8th, the Brockton High School also will be putting on the annual December show. 
Save the date for Brockton's High, Brockton High's holiday concert. On December 17th and 18th, both the band and chorus will perform a special tribute to our amazing director, Mr. Vincent Macrina, a member of Brockton High, class of 1966. Finally, a congratulation to this year's 260 seniors who were honored to receive the John and Abigail Adams Scholarship, a scholarship that provides tuition to a state university. Thank you again for all your support. Thank you. Appreciate you being here. Thank Great you. report, as always. So next, I want to bring up uh, Sharon Wolder, our Chief of uh, Student Support Services. She's going to give us an update on the um, equity training she has been um, going through with our principals um, who also need to go through that with our teachers um, and she'll go over a, um, a quick update for that um, coming from the Department of Ed. Uh, Sharon has done a great job with this so thank you Sharon for being here. Okay, I know. Oh, it's I already think she on. Turns it on. Yeah. Great, I don't have to push the button. <laughs> thank you and congratulations. Thank you. Uh, as part of our CPR review with the Department of Education, we had several areas of corrective action. We've uh, presented the corrective action to you months ago, and we have continued to work to address some of those things. One of the areas that we had to do a lot of work in was in uh, our equity work that we do in the district, and that includes training all teachers to look for uh, areas of equity, stereotypes, um, any area that is lacking diversity in curriculum. And they needed to be trained to look at it specifically for the curriculum that they're using and the lesson plans that they're designing. So that the, what they're presenting in classes is far more equitable and inclusive of all students in their classrooms. This is a big change and in most cases, we are now asking some teachers to look for things that they were never taught themselves. And so in our efforts, we had to design an equity toolkit for them so that they would know exactly what to look for throughout their classrooms, throughout the schools, throughout the materials that they're using, if there are stereotypes, to figure out how to address them, uh, to acknowledge them and to help students see that there are areas where there is a lack of inclusivity in what is being presented and to bring in other resources. And so uh, the Diversity Education Steering Committee that has been working for the last uh, two and a half years now uh, put together a training for all principals. Uh, we worked with them over the last two years and in uh, the summer I had two people, Jody Nelson and Stacy Medina, who are both classroom teachers who spent a lot of time with me this summer working to develop the tool. And so uh, last week we had 43 people uh, in across the district, uh, representatives from every school come to a training. We train them on how to use the tool, how to uh, really address um, culture in their classrooms in a way that is, is comfortable and is useful and where people can learn from each other. Um, and so they, those 43 people are now going to go into all of the schools in our district and lead the trainings with uh, the faculty and administrators in every school in Brockton. So this is work that we know uh, when you look at research, it makes a difference. It makes a difference in academic achievement, it makes a difference in discipline, it makes a difference in attendance, and it makes a difference in our dropout and retention rates. So it's the right work to do, and we have a team of people who have been working hard to really prepare people to do some work that we haven't done in this district. Hi. I'm trying to see you, Ms. Walder. Um, <laughs> could you give an example of um, like what a teacher would be looking for in the curriculum um, as far as when they're looking at stereotypes or cultural, a lack of cultural awareness in like a lesson? So one of the resources that we looked at, and it was in a geography lesson, and it described Native Americans and uh, early settlers. And with the Native Americans, they referred to their housing in a certain way, 
uh, huts and uh, referred to the work that they were doing in a way that minimized what they were doing. And when they referred to the settlers, they were homes and hardworking. And so just something that subtle in the way that um, it was presented, the information was presented. When people looked at it at first, they thought, this is a geography lesson and it doesn't really have anything to do with diversity. But when they dug a little deeper, they started to notice there are some differences in the way things are worded. And so minimizing what one group of people did and had versus another. Uh, another example was even looking at West Side Story and how when they were looking at how the different groups were presented, as one was presented in an aggressive way, identified as sharks, and the other ones as jets. And what is the messaging with that? And it's, uh, West Side Story is a great musical. It doesn't mean you shouldn't teach it anymore, but it does mean that when you're looking at the way things are presented, to be mindful of that and to have those conversations with students so that, that they realize con historical context for some, for, you know, for some of it and in other ways to really take a look at how things are being presented and how they internalize that without realizing it. That's, that's good to hear. I know we talked a lot about that in my school and our professional development, so I'm, I'm glad that we're doing it here too. Thanks. Next, I'm going to bring up uh, uh, Dr. Ethan Cancel, Executive Director of Accountability. He's going to talk about a uh, recent uh, parent survey that went out um, with our uh, report cards in at, at the um, parent conferences. Uh, it was just a survey to ask parents how they feel about our current report cards. Are they easy to understand? Are they, um, you know, is, is, does it really give them an idea of how their child is doing in school? So, Ethan, you have a PowerPoint? Yep. All right, so we'll move out of your way and I'll shut the lights. My back. I think she's going to be. All right, uh, good evening everyone, congratulations Mike. Do you want a uh, bad joke, Tom? Okay, so here it goes at Mike's expense. Everyone knows I'm trying to increase the level of rigor in the district and this includes my jokes and my own personal um, reading and performance. So I told Mike, you know, it's been a long time, but I'm actually getting around finally to reading the book by Stephen J. Hawking. He said, you know, it's about time, Ethan. All right, so. <laughs> um, Sharon is, uh, has agreed to help me, and she told me uh, I have a very limited amount of time, so <laughs> whether I want it or not, she's moving. So let's go, Sharon. Here we go. Uh, the assessment team, it's a uh, multidisciplinary team. It's a whole group of different people across the district and we look at different things. Assessment is one of them, report cards is another one. And we decided, you know, it's a good idea to look at could we possibly improve our report cards and um, rather than just sitting in a room by ourselves on a Friday afternoon, which is when we meet, um, we, asked, we said, why don't we just ask the parents? It's really going to parents, so why not ask them what they think about the report cards? We did this during teacher-parent conferences. This was only for the uh, elementary and middle school parents. It's not for the high school. You're not changing the high school report cards. It's a very important, um, and it has very different implications. But um, we asked these questions, basically, as, as Mike alluded to. Do our report cards communicate student progress effectively? Basically, do you like them? Are they too long, too short? Are they at the right time? And this was the interesting question. Next slide. So we had four, <coughs> I'm sick again. We had 490 parents who responded. As you can see, the majority of these parents were uh, pre-K through five. Um, 159 parents were um, parents of middle school children and 331 were uh, K through 5. 
So it's 68%, almost 70-30 split, but it's a, it's a decent rate. We want to we want obviously to um, get more responses, but it, it's, it's a lot of people. Next slide. So here are the results. Overall, and this surprised us, parents are pretty positive about the report cards. We didn't know if it was because when we asked them, it was during parent-teacher conferences where they've just gone over the report cards, so anything they didn't understand, they now understand. Or if they're just nice and polite, because we didn't really ask very pointed questions. But over, overall, they were positive. The thing that really jumped out, the, um, the biggest takeaway was parents want information about how their kids are doing prior to getting the report card. They're saying it's too late. We don't know until now. We can't, we can't act. We can't intervene. So we took that very seriously, and we have some, I think, some good ideas how to deal with that. There was a little bit of, um, yes, we want more information, but we don't want more information in terms of volume. We just want what we're getting to tell us more. So it's more clarity but not a ton of pages. They don't want a you know, 600 item report card. And the thing that kills me, but it again was pretty clear, parents like paper report cards. I wanted it to be electric, e electronic, you know, it'd be great, send them all out, but nope. Um, all right, next steps. We're going to come up with some possible alternatives to what we have, and that's going to be over the winter. We've already been starting this, but we're going to work on this now. We're going to convene more panels of educators and parents to review what we've come up with. We don't want to sit again by ourselves in a room and come up with a brilliant idea. We really want to have people involved in this. Um, then in the springtime, we're going to present these selections to the superintendent, uh, June Saban McGuire, you know, our chief academic uh, officer, and we'll hopefully come up with a final selection. But they, it will be vetted. I'm sure that we'll sh show it to you as well. Um, it will have, you know, passed through something. And then, if indeed it does come to pass, we'll roll out the improved report card. Um, in the fall of 2020. So that's the idea. It's possible that we don't change things. It is possible. If, if we come up with stuff and everyone says, no, we hate it, we like the way it was, well, then we'll keep it the way it was. But um, we think that we'll be able to make some improvements. And we do think that um, Infinite Campus and the parent portal, or the student portal, um, is, is really changing things. Kids really check that to see their grades all the time. And that's, that's one thing that is true, and you know parents can do it also. And so we just have to encourage more people to do that, and that is part of our uh, plan as part of the contract. We're going to be working with uh, providing professional development for teachers to make sure that everyone does know how to do this. And uh, you know hopefully that will address some of the, uh, the concerns. And that's it. Any questions? Yes. With your, uh, one of the slides, uh, you said that the parents were overwhelmingly in support of what the report cards were, uh, but yet they wanted information prior to. Yes. It, they were positive. They, they were not, the overwhelming was the, uh, they want it earlier. Okay. All right. So what we, and, and I have to go to where uh, I was a teacher, what we did at the college level, mm -hmm. mid-semester, yep. we would do evaluation. So each, and we would send them out to each of the students. So what we would do, this is prior to them getting their report cards or their, their grades, okay? So at about seven weeks in to a 15-week semester, we would do mid-semester evaluations. So it was real simple, and what we would do is to transmit those to the students. Obviously, we wouldn't send them to the parents because college is a whole different right, ballgame. Right. But maybe a thought about doing a mid midterm Yep. Uh, report saying this is an area of improvement. This is, I, I don't think you have to change, in my opinion, I don't think you have to change the report card. I think maybe coming up with a, an evaluation, yep. minor evaluation, yep. uh, halfway through the term. It's an excellent idea. Yeah, absolutely. We, 
that is a very, you know, it, it's, it's a good idea. It's something that we don't do in Brockton and that we could do. That Thank you. When a parent goes into a parent teacher conference, they've got something in their hand yep. to say and have a dialogue. Yep. Uh, you know, because I remember going into parent teacher conferences when all my kids were in the Brockton right. schools. Uh, you know, we, we, were, we just went there seeking information. Uh, but if we have some information to begin with, then we can, we're able to have maybe a meaningful dialogue as to where the kids were. So we as parents at home could support what the kids yes. were doing in the classroom. Yep. So just a Thank you. You're welcome. That was a good one. Um, I forget what they were called, but the parent would get like a notification the child wasn't doing well right. before the report card. Progress note? M yes. Do we still do that? It's, it's not as, um, how can I say, it's not as systematic as it could be. Okay. So uh, I think we're all kind of seem to be going in the same direction here. Um, on the, the uh, earlier notification, um, you talked about it sounds like, and I remember way back when, when I was in school, progress reports were kind of at the parent's request if a student mm -hmm. was struggling, mm -hmm. not just general practice. Yes, yes. So uh, have you had any discussions yet at this point, um, and, and if you haven't, so be it, but I internally about how you'll approach that request and, and what you might be able to put in place? Well. Kind of building on Mr. Bath's point, it's not only a kid who's struggling. Parents want information about how they can support their kid. What happens if right. your, your, your kid is just fabulous in something you didn't know about and you'd like to get him extra art lessons? Well, how do you know? If, if my son is any example, how is school? Good. That's it. Right. That's all I get. <laughs> well, that's what I mean is so uh, not having it just be for the student that's struggling, right. but any student. Yes. So uh, that's what I was asking is have you had any discussions at this point yes. yet about how you might be able to implement that and do that? Yeah, we, we're actually, we've thought about, and it's everything is in very, very beginning draft form, but we've thought about the beginnings of um, this idea of what you said, a... Uh, like an interim report, a progress report, it's, it's, it's different. It, lets, it gives information, it's not a summative grade. Right. But it gives, no matter whether you're struggling, whether you're you know, killing it, you, right. you, the parent gets that information. Okay. So. Right. Just one question, Ethan. Mm -hmm. the, uh, you made it clear that this for elementary and middle school only? Yes. That the high school is a little bit different? It, yeah. And the question is, what's the difference? What? Um, <laughs> grades matter much more at high the school? high school level and when they occur. I mean, it, it involves kids getting into college. It involves, you know, transcripts. So right. we have a different set of uh, criteria for the high school. So we wanted to take a look at the elementary grades. Some of our report cards are very lengthy. You know, it, and some of the parents are saying, I'm not quite sure. What that means. Like, how did, just tell me how my kid did in math. Did he get an A, B, C, or D? You have to go through this standard, that standard, this standard, that standard, this standard. And it's just not giving the information that parents need. So, um, and it's, that's at the elementary level. It's a little different at the middle and mm -hmm. high school levels. Okay. But if, if uh, people are happy with the way it goes with the elementary and middle, we could always look at the high school as well. next. Thank you. Nice report, by the way. We, what we did, we made it really simple. We, when we were doing the evaluation of our students, we would just simply, there were three categories. Doing good, satisfactory. Was it? Yeah. That's all they got. And if they got a warning, then there was a little sentence explaining why they got the warning. But to talk to the difference in the high school transcript, mm -hmm. we at the uh, secondary education level, post-secondary education at the university, 
That's what we look at. We look at the transcript, the high school transcript, because we want to see the progression. We're not interested in what happened in from K to eight. We're interested in what happened right. nine to twelve. Yeah. And that has become the standard fare for acceptance into colleges now. <coughs> not only it's not just SATs or MCAS or whatever. It's what the student does all the way through college. So we look at the freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior year. Most of the times we don't get the senior year, Jim, because uh, by the time the kids are applying for it, senior grades are not in just yet. But we get a good benchmark. We get a good uh, indicator of where the student is. And based on that, that's what we use as an acceptance. So that's probably the biggest difference between the lower grade and the, and the upper grade. Uh, the vast majority of the homes uh, of students that we're dealing with in this city are homes that uh, where English might not be spoken as a first language. Yes. Uh, what are we doing in terms, because one of the things that I hear all the time is how, you know, the, uh, the, the bilingual parents are not really into their, ch into, their, into their children's education because they don't participate into the parents teachers conference they're not making the phone calls to schools to speak with the with the teacher as much as the other ones and we know that from a lot of these homes uh, education is all that these kids actually have and what right. the parents strive for yep. so what are we doing to reach into the homes of these so-called bilingual parents that are very much in tune to figure out exactly what's going on with their kids but, but might lack the uh, the knowledge of what to do, what to ask, what the, what, what's the right approach to, uh, to be able to reach uh, this, the system. Well, Mr. Mayor, I think that's an excellent point. If I had a real quick answer to that tonight, I'd be uh, a genius. I'm, I'm sorry I'm not, but we are working hard at it and we're aware of it. Um, we have representation, I should have said on the assessment team, we have representation, uh, high school, middle school, elementary school, bilingual department, special ed. We have every, every area is covered. So Gloria Cho is one of the members of the assessment team, and that's something we're very concerned about. And that's actually what, what drove a, a big part of our desire to redesign it. If you have a very text-based, very sort of confusing, non-traditional um, report card, how do you make sense of it if it if it doesn't look like what you're used to. It's in a different language, it's not what you're used to, it, it's a problem. So we're trying to come up with ways that, to simplify it and make it give more information. And so it, it and it will be, hope, we'll see. And obviously, obviously it'll be translated, but we're trying to actually communicate better. Because we have, actually have a, a real account of um a parent going to Walmart to buy a kid a bike because the kid did so well in school uh, but he had nothing but F's and he told his parents that his grades were I mean the F actually meant fantastic <laughs> so the, the parent went to Walmart and purchased them a, the kid a bike because he did fantastic in school uh, the poor parent doesn't know any better you know because nobody bothered to explain to the fact that this is a brand new system uh, where a lot of the homes that these kids come from are homes where the, the scoring system is not the same as this system, so the, the, right. the parent didn't really know that right. the kid had nothing but Fs in his, uh, in his report. Right, and you know, people know that I like to deal with numbers, and a number is a little easier than fantastico, yeah. <laughs> so. Um, but we'll, we are, I, I, I put down your uh, point, put a star next to it. it, it's something that we're gonna keep an eye on. And we will, uh, next time, I hope to have a, a more fleshed out answer. Thank you, appreciate it. We, ha we have added the last couple of weeks uh, two bilingual uh, parent liaisons. Um, Kelly Jones at a bilingual department came to me in Aldo. Uh, we had one retire, but she said, I really need to replace the person that just retired. And can we add another one just for Brockton High? Because we didn't, the one, one liaison was just was only part time at Brockton High, so now we've we're replacing one that's retired, adding another one, um, and hope in there hopefully will help us with our communication as far as the report cards, um, the upcoming community center as well. 
I want to have that uh, as a, a big part of uh, parents being able to come in, and that will be part of it, understanding you know, how their child is doing in, in school, but also hearing that from you know, somebody that can communicate clearly about you know, that the F it doesn't mean fantastic. And, yeah. yeah, that's why we made you the <laughs> superintendent, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. All right. Fantastic. Got a nice. I can't remember. Next, I want to bring up Dr. Uh, James Cobbs. Uh, he's going to talk to about the recent safety and security grant we received from the state, um, and uh, we're in the middle of now of spending the money down. Uh, this was for uh, cameras, door locks. Uh, it was about 48,000, it was about 70,000? About 79,000. Okay. 79,000 came from the state. As you know, we're in the process of, um, well, we always upgrade our security systems. Um, most schools, are, we have switched over to the medical locking system. Um, but we still have a good probably eight schools to finish. And mm -hmm. this grant is helping us um, continue that goal of making sure every school um, has the same locking system. Um, it's a medical system. It's what's recommended by all law enforcement um, associations. Um, it's the best system that the m money can buy, and that's what we've been installing over the last five years. Thank you, Dr. Cobb. So he's, Dr. Cobb is going to give us an update. Thank you. Um, good evening, and congratulations, Superintendent. Thank you. Um, this, this grant, is, again, is about $79,000 um, from the Office of Public Safety and Security. Um, it's a Safe Schools and Communities Initiative. Uh, again, as Mike said, the purpose of the grant is to increase school surveillance, video equipment, and install locks. Um, the grant is about $79,000. $29,000 of the, the money is for video cameras, which will install two video cameras at, at, two, at six different locations. The idea is to increase surveillance not only for the, at the school, but in, you know, for the community, for the school police to be able to tap into the cameras and, and be able to you know, go back and look at video from incidents that happened in the street and the neighborhoods. Um, the schools that will get the cameras are Brockton High School, West Middle School, North Middle School, Anon, Baker, and George Elementary Schools. Um, the locks will be, there's a $49,000 part of the grant will be for locks. It will be installed into Hancock School. The video cameras will be installed soon. We're working out with the IT department and facilities department and uh, I, we have a facilities IT kind of section that's doing the physical install of the cameras. We're working out some of the wiring and power connections for those. The, so they'll be installed, you know, within the next few months, and we'll, we'll get those through hopefully before the weather gets too bad and too cold outside. The um, school locks for the Hancock School will be installed this summer when, during the summer break, and we we'll, should have those completed by the end of the break. All the equipment has been purchased and is in, on hand, so we'll just, you know, we'll install them as we go. Good. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask the, the cameras. They are monitored by Brockton police or school police? Both. Both. The, the Both. School, police, school police monitor them from the Brockton High School, their office there, but they, the Brockton police can tap into the system. The cameras are citywide, you know, system. So all the schools, we can, you know, go into the, you name it, parts of the school, the cafeterias are outside the school where the cameras are. So it's a network system. It's, it's Brockton so police can connect to it. DPD well. has access to, yeah, to that system. So if there's a report, for example, for a missing student or, or something, we can tap into the system right away and see if the student's on the grounds or not or has left the building by going back and rolling the camera from any any of the you know, law enforcement can tap into it. Excellent. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, sir. With all the work you do, how did you get this grant? Did, you, uh, did they call you or did you find this grant? Um, we have a, actually Karen Watts is one of my grant department, and they, she kind of likes I don't know she's the guru of grants. She thinks she <laughs> seems to have a crystal ball. I don't, I'm not sure how the this one came about. Um, we get announcements. Yeah, was at the, um, the end of the last budget mm -hmm. session, the governor put this in um, to through the Department of Education, mm -hmm. and then it offered it offered this grant through um, through that. So we, we the most you could get get was eighty thousand. 
Um, mm. So we got the full amount and Karen mm -hmm. applied for it. Um, we also are now we're pending a larger grant from called the COPS grant, which is the federal government. Mm. Um, and that's about a $300,000 grant. And nice. that we applied for that about three months ago and we should know about that by the end of January. So, and that would help us pretty much finish mm. all the door locks across the system um, to the upgrading to the new system um, and then um, and also cameras. And this also uh, covers us with handheld radios to help obviously with communication because our handheld radios now connect directly to uh, the Brockton Police and Fire Department. They do have a 911 channel on those radios. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cobbs. Good evening. Next, I'll bring up Lieutenant Vidaro. Um, two weeks ago, um, Lieutenant Vidaro is, is, um, has started us on the ALICE training. Um, and uh, an email went out two weeks ago to every staff member in the Brockton Public Schools um, and to take this training. Um, we have a, about a month and a half for everybody to go through and finish it. It gives them a certificate. Uh, it's a pretty intensive training. It takes about an hour and 15 minutes online. Um, so Lieutenant Vidaro, uh, commanding officer of school police, is going to just go over some you know, highlights of Alice and you know, that why this is the direction, you know, that we've gone in and um, it's actually going to work out very well. And um, congratulations to Lieutenant Oh, thank Thomas. you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, good evening. School committee members, good evening. First of all, I want to thank you, superintendent and your team, for allowing this, um, school committee for allowing the implementation of the ALICE program in the Brockton Public School System. I think it's, it's enlightening for a lot of the staff members. Um, I've gotten very, very positive reviews from the people that have completed it. So that being said, we'll, we'll go on to, so we initially bought the 2,500 um, invites, you call them, and they go out to all the different um, emails. We ended up needing an additional 200 because of attrition, people coming and going. Once it's, once it's opened and starts to be used, that person leaves, it's already used. We can't reuse that. So. We have to continue to buy some. Um, the program rolled out on the 15th. That's when we started it, the 15th of November. All members have until just before the Christmas holiday to complete it, the 20th of December. Right now, as we, we stand right here, I have the numbers of completions. So we have just over 39.2% completed the program. Um, 10.3 are in progress, and we still have just around 50.6% that haven't started yet. Um, but I would, there's plenty of time to do it. Like, like Superintendent said, it's only an hour and 15 minutes. It's, it's interesting. It's not boring. So, so people will be, um, I think, enthused with it. Like I said, everybody that's done it so far has, um, has given a good review of it. Uh, I think um, Councilmember Sullivan has done it, and she said it was very enlightening for her. So um, I think that's where we stand right now. I can keep updating you. The next steps that we're going to be going through um, was, will be table talk. Once everybody's been put through the, uh, the module, teachers will sit down with their class, you know, age appropriate, of course, and they'll go over the different things that they can do if we do have an incident where an active shooter comes into the building. Then they'll be doing their practice drills, and I hope to implement quite a few of them through the year, like we have, what, four fire drills throughout the year, we should be having the active shooter drills. I know we'd probably have to localize them classroom by classroom, just so there's not like a ton of kids running all at once in the hallways, but to get those kids into that mode of doing like maybe one class at a time, and then we'll do our, our, our drills, where we'll come in and actually do drills, and we'll have to implement those and upload those to the ALICE um, Institute, and then you know, we'll be a certified ALICE um, community. Any questions? Yes. I just want to say that um, I did the training and um, I said, you know, I'm a teacher and I substitute and um, I, it was helpful for me because before it used to be that the teacher had to hide the kids, but now it's turned more to a, towards to save your life. Right. So it, it's a very good training and I, I learned a lot by taking it. 
it's not boring at all, and you have little questions at the end, and I think I got 100%, so. Yeah, so that was another <laughs> thing. We got between 90 and 100% throughout, so yeah. nobody's really it doing wasn't poorly hard. on it. It wasn't hard to do. Right. No. This is that um, it's also set up. We bought extra, so when um, new subs are hired, anybody <coughs> new hired as a custodian, a substitute teacher, in any uh, capacity, any position in the Brockton Public Schools, that they'll get the email as soon as they get uh, an, an email account with BPS, they will get the Alice training, um, and that's throughout whenever they're hired, and that will continue throughout. It's about five dollars. Five dollars per yep. invite. Yes. Per, per invite. Yeah. And then it broke, you know, this is a three year program. So next year there'll be a second module that will come out that will build on the first module. And then we also, everybody doesn't necessarily have to be your specific services, food services, custodial services. Anybody can go into the extra modules. They're like 10, 15 minute long modules for, you know, specific to like the administrative building or the cafeteria or, you know, the, the maintenance, what maintenance guys can do if, if, we do have an active shooter in the building. You know what their responsibilities are, what they can do, um, and like I said, it will build off next year and then the year after, and then after three years, it will be a certified uh, Alice trained community. Yep. Um, I just want to say I like the idea of having the active shooter drills like like we do fire drills. Uh, it's unfortunate that we are in a place and time where it's necessary, mm -hmm. but um, I, I think it's a great idea. Um, you know, it needs to be, unfortunately, muscle memory, just like when you hear that fire alarm go off. Yes. No one has to tell you what to do. You know, get up, go to the nearest exit. Le Even as an adult, I'm in a building, a fire alarm goes off, I'm looking for an exit, you know? Right. So, unfortunately, we need that same level of muscle memory type of reaction um, for this, so I, I would fully support that uh, that kind of um, drill. Yes, it's unfortunate, but it, that does happen. You're going to get some freezing. So yep. I think practice is is very instrumental in getting these kids out. Yeah. They have to. It's got to be muscle memory, like you said. It's got to be close to muscle memory because we can make it right. four times a year. But yeah, anything's better than nothing. Right. Can you one thing? Sure. Um, Only one thing. No, would you agree? A statement of facts and then take a test? Well, it's, you go along through, there'll, there'll be like small tests throughout the module. And then at the end, you'll take like a, I think it's, if I remember correctly, like a 12 question test. And then, and it, and it goes back over everything that you've gone over through the hour long module. It, so in other words, if you don't pass it the first time, can you go back? You can go back and retake the test, yes. On, on that same, what else? you don't have to apply for another test, just take it No, on. no, it's all in the same module. It just kind of, it, it'll tell you you didn't pass it. It'll show you what you, what you didn't, and then it'll say, okay, now what, what, what's your answer now, basically. Okay. It'll allow you to, to, to get better. I think a passing grade is 80 or above. So it's more or less like a general knowledge test? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Lieutenant. All right, great. Appreciate it. And uh, um, last report of the, the night, I'm going to bring up uh, Aldo Petronio. Um, yesterday, Commissioner Riley, Commissioner of the Department of Education, sent out um, pro a three-page highlight of the new Student Opportunity Act that was just signed into law by Governor Baker. Um, I passed one out to everyone tonight just so you could... Um, to see the highlights, Aldo's going to go through and just uh, talk about what this could mean for the Brockton Public Schools. We're not going to have any hard numbers for as far as how much more money is coming in until probably uh, near the end of January. But Aldo can highlight the areas that um, we're looking at getting some more money, which you know is obviously great news for our gateway cities and especially Brockton. The culmination of um, what we began about five years ago with Brockton leading the way as far as uh, putting together a lawsuit against the, the state for the funding, um, joining up with Worcester, New Bedford, and then uh, every other city pretty much fell into play with us and uh, making our trips to the State House with the 
school committee. We brought school buses up there and kids, and we'd met with everyone, uh, Senate president, House president. We met with everyone over the course of the years um, at the State House and at the Department of uh, Education about our plight and basically showing how the formula was not working for us. So the governor, um, last Tuesday, signed into effect the overhaul of the plan. They had done their own review five years ago, and they basically just shelved it. And they, the review told them what they needed to do. So we basically, our push is what made them um, make some actions. So the actions they've taken now is basically on Chapter 70, they've reworked the formula in such that they're looking now at keeping up with inflation. So for the past 10 out of the past 25 years, they pretty much have done nothing on keeping up with health insurance costs, with additional sped costs, um, with the low income factors. You know, they, they, they've assigned one factor to increase the formula by every year, and the factor didn't work because health insurance is going up at 12, 13% some years. So it was not properly funding districts correctly across the board, then especially when it came to English language learners and low-income uh, gateway cities like Brooklyn were really feeling the, the pain of not being properly funded. So the formula begins by addressing that first, and then they're looking at, right away, the, the biggest, they had five factors, and the biggest one was the low-income. So in addressing that, they are now moving the, the scales that they used for providing us funding. They've almost doubled the amounts they give us per child, which is great. What they're going to do is, since our big argument was we have a lot of students that aren't counted, they're not on state assistance, they're not on a list, but there's a poverty factor there. So what they're all going to do right now from my discussions with my counterparts at the Department of Ed, because I nail them on this every time I see them at a conference, is what are you doing about it? For FY21, they're gonna look at our FY16 low income count, which is our highest we've had, because that was the last time we um, had submitted lunch applications. We were about 81% at that point. It was after that that they stopped looking at lunch applications. We dropped down to about 55% because that's all that showed up. So they said for the first year, they're going to use that number. So the first year should be pretty good for us because that's the highest, um, they used the word decile before, but that's the highest factor that you can receive. It's about $8,000 per student um, is what they're going to factor in. now. They have said that they're going to they're going to implement this over seven years. They don't know how much each year, so you can. I asked if you could assume one seventh. They said no, but either way, it's the highest factor. We'll receive that. So, the second year, they're going to try and come up with a way to measure those students that aren't being picked up right now. And we've given them myself. I've given them many um, um, what I consider my my scenarios or my formulas on how to get you know gather those students and. If Brockton's at a 60% low income uh, status on a number of students, then take the students that aren't ca categorized and give us 60% of those. You know, I've, I've thrown these ideas at them. So we should see something pretty well come in on the low income piece and that um, will help us the fact that the city and the state is gonna be doing the census. So that census count is very, very important uh, for us. We've offered our assistance to the mayor's office in helping get the word out on this because if Brockton overall gets a better count on their um, on a, all the citizens who live here, then that in turn will change our overall factor of how poor our district is according to um, state standards. Because if you're not counting 20% of the residents and you're not getting that factor, so that could help us also in the formula. So that's why it's hard to actually, as the superintendent was saying, come up with a number of what we're going to receive. <coughs> They've. We've all complained about special education costs, number one, being so high, and they don't reimburse us as well. We've also complained that we spend, Brockton spends over a million dollars transporting special ed students. Years ago, the state would give us a reimbursement on that, almost 100%. But for the past about 12, 13 years, they haven't given us that, no one. So now they're looking at implementing a reimbursement for, for special education students for their transportation. They reimburse us partially on the education, nothing on the transportation. So they're gonna look at phasing in, hopefully it says 25% per year, but at this point, we'll, again, we, we, us in the city are putting out over a million dollars and not getting any subsidy from the state. So if, you know, if we got 25% of that um, first year, that'd, that'd be wonderful. So, and along with that, again, I said the education portion, 
they fund us around 68%. Some years they get up to as high as 70, 71%. They're supposed to fund a lot more for our special education costs. The reason that formula is in place is because years ago, as students went to a state facility, the state paid the whole thing and they were theirs. The state kind of got out of that business and put the schools in that business. So they put us in, but then they wouldn't reimburse us fully for them. So they're looking to make um, some progression on that in the formula. Charter school tuitions and reimbursements, as you know, every year, every student that goes to a charter school, they take our dollars with them. And there was a formula in place to give us back 100% the first year, what we, what we lost. And then 60% the second year, 50% the third year, or 25% for five years, they've had different formulas in place. The problem is they've never once funded the second, third, fourth, fifth years. Last year it was a $2.1 million hit to the city of Brockton. We wrote our letter, we complained, just as all the other districts did, and it went on deaf ears, and they basically said, well, it's subject to appropriation, meaning if they don't have the money, they're not paying it. They now said they're gonna try and make a commitment to that, then they're gonna try and um, um, give us that money every single year. And in doing so, I think they're also gonna try and give charter schools additional funds, and I think that's why they're making this promise. But either way, that'll help us quite a bit. Um, as you know, I mean, our budget shortfalls, even last year, was $5 million. If we had the $2 million from charter schools, it would have been huge. It would have been a, a great um, boost for us. So going forward, we won't see numbers like that again because as those reimbursements come into play, they last for only a total of five years, and we're about five years into this charter school, so we've lost everything in the past. So we'll gain a little bit, but not, not a great amount, but hopefully no other charter schools are allowed to open in Brockton because they're not needed, um, they're not necessary. So, and then the, the culmination of this whole financial package they put together for us is that um, they're gonna be looking for Brockton to show the evidence that we have met um, some progressive goals in the achievement gap. They wanna know from us before they give us the money what we're going to do with it, how we plan on uh, um, improving the student scores, um, what, basically what our plan is so they can review it, then they're gonna measure us on that. So um, uh, we're not afraid of being measured on any of those things. My argument is all the other districts in the state that received money in years gone past never had to do anything for it, they just received it. Now that the gateways are gonna be making out on this new plan, they're gonna be holding us really accountable for, for the additional funds where they've never had other districts held accountable, just us. But as we all know, we actually, Brockton has probably been the best of all the gateways as far as showing student achievement. We have taken our students who have been here over a period of five, six years and shown that they do better performance wise than most kids in the state. So hopefully um, come January, it's usually the third week of January, we'll get our budget from the governor, we'll, um, um, see what new funding we're going to receive, and then we'll have a plan put together as to how to address our needs. You know, we turn to the superintendent and, and the teaching and learning side as to what is the best way to take these additional funds and implement them into the system. So, um, you know, we've got quite a few million in, in costs next year that are gonna come automatically. Hopefully, they'll give us more money than what our costs go up the first year. So, um, the, the goal is, to have that extra million or two dollars that we can then invest into the school system with our plan and show some improvements in our, our students that'll keep the state happy, that'll keep our funds flowing. So that's, that's really what we wanted to achieve was getting these additional funds, having the state recognize that gateway cities especially um, not only need but deserve these extra funds because we, we educate the hardest students um, in the Commonwealth to educate So while I was happy that this was signed and I'm, I would say I'm cautiously optimistic, you know, as over the last four years and, and, and for you even longer, I think this goes back about six years really, mm -hmm. um, but at least the last four years of my time on the committee, you know, I, I, I think it's safe to say we've had our hearts broken more than once and also seen the goalpost moved. We yeah. found and got more kids certified. They lowered the reimbursement per student. And so the charter reimbursement, they didn't fully fund that. So now they're saying they're going to, 
and I'm cautiously optimistic, but again, hopefully we don't get the same line of subject to appropriation and those same kinds of things. But I um, asked that question at one of my state meetings yeah. and I kind of got a dirty look. <laughs> I said, is it shall or, or is it may? And they didn't like that, but so the, which a lot of it, it says may. It may? I, yes, a lot of it says may. So. Right, and, and that's the concern that, that I have. So I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. I'm, I'm happy that they finally did do something with that foundation budget review committee recommendations. I mean, again, like you said, they put it on the shelf for five years and didn't do anything with it. Um, but I, I, I am concerned by, you know, just some of the ways we've seen in yes. the past. For example, this year they gave us a two point from $2.4 million grant that last year was given to us as Chapter 70, which right. means next year we start out without that. So right away on my charts, I start out with a negative $2.4 million. So it's going to make it seem like their additional money to us is even greater than what it is. But, you know, it starts off that way. But I, early on when we received that, that was the first question I asked. Is that Chapter 70 or is that a grant? And they said it's a grant. So... Well, and, and so these are the things that are concerning yes. is, again, like I said, I'm cautiously optimistic. I know I'm often the buzzkill on these things, and I, and I hate to do that, but, you know, um, it, it's just, again, over the last four years, I've definitely, as we've talked about and dealt with, you know, some of the ways that what was supposed to happen didn't happen. Let me ask you this, and, and again, we just have to wait until January and see what the number is, and then we'll know, and then we can pick it apart and see what really happened. In those meetings that you went to, my understanding is, and, and, and you kind of said it, that you know, you, you poked the bear a little bit, if you will, and, and, and pushed them a little. What did you, I mean, did you come away feeling reasonably confident that they are actually going to go by this and do what needs to be done here? Yes, no, I'm reasonably confident that we're going to be receiving um, more money. I mean, t 10 million or $12 million, probably more next year. Right. 10, million, 10 million will be eaten up right away in our budget right. um, between you know the loss of that grant, just the regular increases in costs that we have. Um, but if it, comes in, if it comes in more than that, then you know, I think even if we had a million dollars extra, I think that's a oh, good okay. amount of money to really start doing something with. And right. knowing that, somebody got, that it will be coming in every year right. would be great. And we also, we've been losing students to the charter so that again, um, if we're down um, 300 students, that's $5 million almost that we lose. So, um, you know, as, as the charter has grown, the charter has a total of 735 seats, and right now there are, I think, over 500 of them have been filled that we've lost. But they've also increased seats at the other charters, the Foxborough Charter, the, um, the Charter in Norwell. They've all increased their number of seats, so we've lost more students to those schools also. So we're probably over 1,200 kids in charter schools right now. And you know what bothers me about the charter? aspect of it. Well, there's a lot that bothers me about charters, but one thing is part of their pitch is that they can do it better and cheaper. And yet, so where's, if they're supposed to be able to save the taxpayer money, why are they getting anything more? But anyway, that's more of a soapbox exactly. issue. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm less than cautiously optimistic because I went through this whole thing and there's some wording in here that really troubles me. Um, and I hope you're right, Aldo, you know, and if we do get 10 million, that would be great, but then we have to subtract the 2.4 million, so that yes. drops us down to 7.6 million. So we're gonna be losing money on that end. So right. we would have to make that up. So the hope is, is that we get more. So, but uh, I, again, because you, you feel good about it, it makes me feel good about it, but I gave this, this, these three pieces of paper are great, and for me it was about a C, okay? Um, because there were certain things that I looked in here, so is that in the low-income census, it means is that they're studying the options. Did they give us a time frame on when that was going to be completed? Because they're holding our feet to the fire. Michael, you've got to do this plan by April 20th of 2020 mm -hmm. for all of this, and, who th and who's going to manage all of that? I mean, that's a big deal for, for us to do. But did they give you any, any indication? The Department of Ed said they would need probably two years, but the governor's office has said one year. So I, I usually listen to the Department of Ed. See, that's what I mean. I'm less than cautiously optimistic, maybe mm -hmm. somewhat. 
the other thing that uh, I'm looking at in the charter school tuition costs and reimbursement. In the last sentence it says, but please remember that the final amounts can differ significantly from the initial estimates. That could go up, it could go down. But given their track record, I think that just may go up. How do they, you feel about that? They, they actually read the number of students at the charters three times during the course of the year. So uh, in October 1, then just shortly after January, and then right around, um, around April or May. And they look at those, and they, that's when they have their estimates made for the following September. Okay. So they, they work off of those estimates. And when they're planning for the next year of how much they're going to charge you, they'll look back at three readings from the previous year and come up with an estimate of what is necessary for the charters. So when they don't estimate low. So um, Yeah, I didn't think they would estimate low. Right. Okay. Estimating high. If you estimated high and numbers came in a little bit less, then you could go lower. But they would never go lower. They, they seem to always go higher. There's this this love affair with charter schools at Correct. the expense of public schools, which is, for me, is a problem, always has been. Um, the other thing is I'm looking at the district evidence based on three-year plans. Now, I read this whole thing in here, and uh, for the, the, our new superintendent, uh, your team is going to have to do all of this by April the 20th, mm -hmm. okay? And we may not get, and, and the state is saying it's going to take us a year to look at other options and whatever. So. The other thing is, who's going to lead this group, or have you done work on this already? No, we've been talking about Okay. Yes. All right. A lot of the, um, it has to be, we're going through another district review in, in March, so we probably, once we go through the district review, um, we won't, because they do that every six years. Right. Okay. So, which this is kind of, you know, it's interesting because we won't get the results of the district review <coughs> until probably August. And this is due April 1st, so it's, you know, it's kind of difficult to put a plan together when you're going to get your feedback right. for the Can district review months after. So, actually, I have an urban superintendent's meeting this okay. uh, Friday in Marlboro, um, and Commissioner Riley will be there to answer questions about the Student Opportunity Act. And, this is mm -hmm. a lot of, and there's a lot of questions, just like yours, that I've been going back and forth in emails with the other uh, urban superintendents. So there's a lot of those questions. Can you see why I'm act. Exactly. less than cautiously yep. optimistic exactly. about this? Yep. I, I just, and I'm not, this is my second last meeting, so this is going to be on you guys. Yep. Yep. But I think you've got to do your due diligence on this here. When I read this over, I went through it line by line, and I came up, I mean, it's like, it's like a bad essay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think it also says in there that the commissioner can kind of change the rules as you oh, yeah. go. Isn't, yeah. that, isn't that good? But we can't. We can't. Okay. Can. So the, the other thing is, is um, do the charter schools have to do the same type of report that DESE is forcing the Brockton Public Schools to do? In other words, do the charter schools have to come up with a... Uh, uh, an evidence-based three-year plan for them to receive the funding from each of our districts. Do they have to do that, or is it just do they show up to the window and they get their money and then they walk out? I don't know. Ethan, I think they go through a different review, correct? Uh, they go through a different review, but as, as you well know, Mr. Bass, um, they don't have to accept the same general review either. That's right. That's what I'm saying. Uh, yeah, and it, and it is a problem because this isn't a level playing field. Because they just mm -hmm. turn up and get their check and then they adios. And then we're left, you're left, you guys are going to be left with how do we handle this, yep. you know, with a reduced, with a reduced budget. So uh, I just, I hope you can do this, Aldo, but I, I, I'm just. I, I can the balance the budget. Can, it's up to Mike Thomas and them to yeah. get the kids' scores up. Yeah. Yes, yeah. no question about it. Yep. But get the kids' scores up. It's easy to say that, but get the kids' scores up using a level playing field. Exactly. Yep. Okay? So if we can go and get a level playing field here, yeah, then I'm all for that. I'm all for But when you've got a scale that's in, in, mm -hmm. in balance like this, here they are and here we are, but yet we're performing. It's just like that nonsense about turnaround schools. You know, 
you know, on Monday we're not, we don't have any turnaround schools. On Tuesday, because they moved the goalposts, now we have seven turnaround schools. I don't know how that works. Yeah. I'm just. Yeah, I hear you. It's a yeah. conundrum. Yes, exactly. Thank yep. you. Thanks, Aldo. True. Like, like the, the mayor used to say, you know, hopefully this isn't just the crumbs they used to throw. That was yeah. a, a line uh, Mayor Rodriguez uses all the time, and that, you know, it's about time they stop just throwing us crumbs, and hopefully mm -hmm. this is more than the crumbs. Well, I also, I, I also think it's important for us to, um, and I was just talking to the superintendent <laughs> about this, that the state needs to know that there's no appetite in this city to move away from that lawsuit. You know, and that is something I think we need to make very clear to every single person out there, the folks at the State House, the governor, and everybody else, that we're not going to pull back from this. It's just on standby. We're going to continue to water this plant up, mm -hmm. and as soon as it, it, it falters, we're going to go after them. And I think they need to understand that, mm -hmm. that there's no appetite on the part of the city side, the school side, of us not pushing this thing forward, and we're going to push it if we need to. So they have an obligation to... You know, we're going we're gonna to hold them accountable. This is, they're holding us accountable on certain things. We're going to hold them accountable on the promises that they made with the fear of this lawsuit, and we're going to make sure that they know that we have no intention of pulling this thing back. It's just on standby right now. We hit mm -hmm. the pause button, but we didn't, we didn't hit the power button. It's just, it's just on pause so that they know. Well, I, I agree with you. And when, <coughs> at MASC, when we voted on some of these measures, it was unanimous, okay? And I'm, I'm thinking here that that Desi and the governor didn't listen to the voices of the 360 school districts that voted unanimously to support increased funding. Yep. So, but you're right, Mayor, we have to keep their feet to the fire. Yeah, we do. So uh, they, wanna, they, they want us to do a plan? I wanna see their plan. Yeah. We should all wanna see their plan. Yeah. Mr. Sullivan, do you wanna say something? Yeah. Aldo, I just wanted to thank you for the work you have done as well as the past superintendent and Mike Thomas, on all the meetings you attended. My feeling, I may be wrong, but my feeling is that without you attending all those meetings, conferences, driving out of state, the tons and tons of miles, that we wouldn't even have this if it wasn't for you guys. Thank I you. I just wanted to thank you. Thank you. You done? Yep, that is the end of my report. I think. Thank you, sir. Do we have any items that we want to refer to the subcommittees? Anything? Good. Do we have any unfinished business? Good. Business. Do we have any new business? This is a new business. Uh, New business. Go ahead, Mr. Uh, so this is to request that the uh, time change um, for the December 17th school committee meeting. Um, if you'd like to change the start time of that meeting on the 17th of December from 7 p.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, because the holiday concert starts at 7 p.m. So usually we have an earlier meeting so then we can adjourn and, and attend, obviously, and see the wonderful concert that the uh, Broughton High students and, and uh, Mr. McCrina put together. So that's been the practice for the last several years. So, but we have obviously have to make that an official vote today to change the time of that meeting. Motion, motion to change the December 17th meeting of the school committee from 7 p.m. to 6 p.m. Second. Motion has been properly made in second to move the meeting from seven to six. All those in favor, all those opposed, the meeting will be at 6 p.m. And that will be at the Broughton High. We'll be back at the Broughton High Little Theater for that. One thing on the subcommittee. Go ahead, sir. We had talked, Mike, we were going to do a safety security subcommittee in January. Yes, we'll, we'll um, yeah, we'll for, for, in transportation. Transportation. Yeah, so we'll get an update on the work that Aldo and I have been doing on, uh, you know, doing some of our transportation in-house. So um, we'll, we'll put that on. Um, in mid-January. Go ahead, sir. Uh, this, um, yesterday was a, a big day in Mr. Thomas and I, high school lives. It's the first Monday after Thanksgiving, yeah. <laughs> first day of fall sports. Um, so I'd like to wish all the BHS athletes the best of luck this uh, winter, not fall, uh, this, this season. It's, uh, it's always a fun 
fun time of year for me. I go to a lot of basketball games and track meets, watching our kids compete. So good luck to you guys and ladies. Uh, I'll see you around. Anyone else? Go ahead, Mr. Menachel. Helping hands jingle bell run is uh, over at the high school. Uh, I believe it's 1.30. 1.30, regist uh, 1 o'clock, uh, registration in the red cafeteria. Yep. Uh, yes. And then they'll do the run. Yep. And then yes. lunch back in the red calf. It's a great, it's a great event. Um, if you can bring a toy or, or a donation for uh, a lot of the children in Brockton that um, don't have uh, like some of the other kids do. It's, a, it's always a good event. It is a free lunch. Dave Gorman does a wonderful job. Um, but it's just a fun, it's a fun, happy day. Uh, <clears throat> there's always uh, you know, gift baskets. You know, you buy um, you know, a number of coupons and yeah. you, know, you never know what you're going to end up with. And there's uh, uh, obviously a whole bunch of donations that people actually you know, bid on. Um, but it is a fun day. And um, I would um, encourage anyone that would like to spend a little fun time and do a little something for the kids at Brockton. It's a good event to attend. So I would get there 12, 30, 1 o'clock yeah. to register and then give yourself time to, you know, check out prizes and things. Uh, and then it does, uh, the course always changes. So Dave will figure out what the course will be this year, but it's always fun. You have some, some adults who uh, like to run and a lot of people who just like to walk it, yeah. like myself. <laughs> okay. So thank you. Uh, Mr. D'Agostino. Uh, I thought it would be appropriate to mention we had our uh, city holiday parade this past Saturday and I wanted to mention the great job all the kids did who were uh, either in school bands or f um, uh, floats for their school or you know just all the various different things that kids were involved in representing their school. Uh, they did a great job and, and I just wanted to congratulate and, and thank all of them for um, every year they, they just they do a wonderful job so very good well I just wanted to um, I know we just had our first snow day uh, of the year hopefully this is one and done yeah. we don't have any more that'd be nice but it, it, uh, wishful thinking but um, I just want to thank everybody from the city side from the school side of the wonderful work that yep. they did to uh, uh, to this point to, to keep the uh, the parking lots and the schools uh, clear of snow. Uh, I also want to remind people who are watching us at home that uh, it's important for people just to shovel their sidewalk. Yeah. We've got a, a lot of uh, young kids that walk to school and sometimes they're walking in the middle of the road. Uh, we can't really plow every sidewalk yeah. in the city but um, we're going to try to do the best we can to plow the, the, the most of the sidewalks but there's still some of these little side roads that are um, the sidewalks are a little small, but, but the citizens need to help us out yep. and, pl and kind of shovel their sidewalk to make sure that our young people are walking safely in the streets as they go to school. So that's my appeal to them. And I know I'm going to get bombarded with phone calls saying, aren't you the mayor? Clean up the sidewalks. <laughs> but uh, we're, we're going to try, you know, we're, yep. we're going to continue to do the best we can with that. But I think it's also important for, yep. for people to help us out. Yeah, the city about? does a great job. They, they go out about a mile and a half to two miles from every school yeah. on the sidewalks. And as you know, there's hundreds of miles of yeah, sidewalks we got a lot across of the, the city. But they do a great job. Again, they go out about almost two miles from every school in the district. And, um, and that was a work in progress for a long time. But the last several years and this year, it's been no different. They were out this morning yeah. at 930 doing, starting the sidewalk. So, um, and they do a great job. So we always I thank the mayor's office and the DPW for the, the work yeah. they do. Um, getting us uh, back to school quickly, um, and uh, I appreciate it. We have a, uh, and a go ahead, Mr. Michel. Is that the? Uh I'd like to also compliment uh, Mayor Rodriguez. I was reading the paper the other day. Oh gosh! For his perfect rescue <laughs> of a little kitty up in the tree. <laughs> so yes, Mr. Coming. Mayor, you you're doing a wonderful job, and I just couldn't let that go. I was I just remember, it just hit me. <laughs> but um, yeah, you are, you, are, you, are, you are a humanitarian of people and certainly have a big heart for the animals of the city of Brockton. Well done, you well know, done. You know, the interesting thing behind that whole thing is the cat didn't even belong to a woman <laughs> after the phone call. <laughs> she was just worried about this poor cat sitting on a tree for a day and a half or so. So 
Uh, and it was kind of, it was about 35 feet high, so we, uh, we were a little concerned that this poor thing was going to jump off. And, but it was mostly because this woman was so worried about this cat. So it was kind of dual mission, you know, to try to keep the lady a little um, appeased, but at the same time try to save that little cat. But I've gone through so much abuse with this whole cat thing. <laughs> boy, oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Minichello, for bringing Just that up again. raises your dander, huh? You know? It made my day, though. You know, I went, uh, for, for a second, though, I had forgotten all the troubles of City Hall. And I walked in, and then it hit me again. So it started all over again, but it was pretty good. We have an executive session. Uh, so um, I just want to make, sh make sure that we are clear with the folks that are watching us that once we adjourn from this meeting, we will not be coming back. So would someone like to make a motion that we go into executive session as the issue that we might be discussing might become a little detrimental to the business of the school committee? Uh, I make a motion to go into executive session for the purposes of uh, uh, Legal um, legal issues that uh, are being um, considered and presented. Um, so we have a uh, so it falls within the uh, purview of accepted uh, reasons legally appropriate to enter into executive session. Um, a motion has been properly made and second, and I'm going to do a roll call. Right, let me see. Me? Yes. Mr. Manichello? Yes. Is, uh, Mr. Bath? Yes. Mr. Diagostino? Yes. Mr. Gormley? Yes. Uh, Judy Sullivan? Yes. Uh, Mr. Sullivan? Yes. Uh, one, two, three, four. Six on the affirmative and none on the, um, in, on the opposite side of things. So we're, motion carries. And as I, as I said, we're going to uh, adjourn from this meeting and we will not be returning. So. Would someone entertain a motion to adjourn the school committee meeting for today, December 12th, December 3rd, 2019? Motion Motion has been properly made and second. All those in favor? All those opposed? The meeting is adjourned.